Hi, this is uh, Game Design, Animation Design 475, Professor Patrick Lukti. Fall 2020 at Zayed University. Welcome. Um, basically, at the moment, where we're at is that we are uh, finishing up our board game design, going into our first um, design cycle. And what's due right now are, we have a couple sheets. One is an idea sheet and troubleshooting sheet, basically to work out the idea of your design. And work out, it also has character ideas. And the other thing that we have is a case study, which is basically I want you to go in and take a look at um, a game, analyze it, pull it apart, and use that information for your own project. So, next class after this, we are also going to be looking at the first draft of your game design. But at this point, not many have submitted. But that's not unusual. So, let's do by Wednesday the idea worksheet, our case study and the initial layout and rules. So do that in whichever way you need to do that. So what's next? So I'll review things over Wednesday through Sunday. Sunday is a work and questions day. And then Wednesday is a crit day and that is October 1st. So I want you to remember a number of things going into this. Um, how does your art relate to your gameplay? That's one. And there's four things. How do your characters and environment add to the experience that you're building? What do your game pieces look like? And how easy are the rules? So, how does the art relate to the gameplay? This is very simple, but we can see here we're at the beginning stages of building and the art, you know, is representing primarily the challenges, you know, like getting over the big, big valley, going over the river, trying to get from the point over to the castle. And then as we go later on, there will be like balloons that will take you over the, over the valley, bridges, boats, things like that. So, um... So, you know, how does the artwork relate? Well, there was a game that was uh, a big seller, I think, for Milton Bradley in the United States called Uncle Wiggly. And so it was created by a guy named Howard Garris who uh, basically uh, did a number of children's books and then the head of the newspaper, the Newark News in, in New Jersey in the United States, asked him if he would do a daily a little bit about Uncle Wiggly and he started doing that. So the thing is is that then um, basically about this guy Uncle Wiggly, this this Uncle Wiggly Long Ears and his friends and um, along with this eventually there was a um, this 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 race game that was all about Uncle Wiggly and his friends and this daily syndicated story um, that um, that illustrated the story and basically built on the franchise. It was really successful for a long time. So the next thing that I'm thinking about here is that how do your characters and environment add to the experience? Monopoly has proven to be kind of like this general template that you can put any identity on. It's kind of a structure. So, in this case, here's a Sailor Moon themed version. Instead of community chess, and that sort of thing, you have love and friendship, you're building teams of sailors and um, of sailor knights and, you know, kind of playing with the whole uh, toy animation um, archive. I mean, um, franchise. Um, let's see here. And 
Yeah, the thing that's sort of interesting, though, is that, you know, the, the corner things, go to jail, um, free parking, 200, 200, 200 stars, these sorts of things, you know, they're still, they're still linking it to the traditional monopoly. So you've got this flavor that's been put over on the monopoly, and then you've turned it into this other thing. And the thing is, there's over a couple hundred different types of monopoly. You know, there's Star Wars monopoly, there's a Dubai monopoly, there's, you know, all sorts of monopoly. So um, this is really interesting where one game franchise has turned into, you know, this whole series of experiences. Then once again, Uncle Wiggly is all based around this guy's characters and his daily franchise. So, another interesting that thing that happened is that I think it's, we talked in another uh, thing about the uh, in the 1800s, uh, a lot of American games were about morals and how to live a good life and, and all these things. Um, and this is a really famous game called The Mansion of Happiness. Um, it was kind of like this instructive and moral game that... Uh, was just inspired on what was thought was proper moral behavior in America in the 1800s. Um, in many ways, you find the same sorts of game mechanics in um, in this as you do in um, you know things like snakes and ladders. Um, so, which I think is really interesting. You have these advances, these setbacks. It's basically a race. Um, you know, just these, just these chances that are amplified by these different rule combinations of advances and setbacks or cards. So basically, you know, different levels of chances then amplifying the the um, aspects of the gameplay. Here's a historical example. I mean, example of a historical um, set of events put into a, a board game called uh, the Lewis and Clark board game. I think that the uh, Lewis and Clark were a couple famous American um, explorers who wanted to find out what was, um, you know, find out the landscape of America out to Oregon because at the time, there had been very few people out there, so they and a guy named Sacagawea went out. Actually, they did a number of different uh, journeys, and this is represented in the game. And it's uh, kind of like saying, "Okay, how do you get, how do you get from like Washington D.C. to Oregon and explore the uh, the Western Frontier?" Um, we now know that this is kind of a colonial narrative, but um, interesting as a structure nonetheless. And then on the other hand, being that this is during the COVID quarantine, um, you know, you have things like, you know, very interactive card games like Exploding Kittens, which is one of my favorites. And so basically, the guys at the uh, Oatmeal who produce it, you know, come up with a way to play, you know, exploding kittens over, over Zoom. So it's kind of, kind of a funny thing. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's basically just a, a card game that you're usually playing game uh, cards on top of other cards, but you have to um, kind of modify the rules a little bit to be doing things in which, you know, you don't have the physical cards in the same place. As with a couple other uh, lectures we've talked about, consider your markers. In other words, are there like printed character pieces? Are they um, just basic pawns like we see here in the in the second picture, or are they kind of like represent representational icons of various aspects of the game? And I'm just reviewing again, and here we go back to chess. Um, you know, with a representational, you know, kind of um, aspect of each of the characters. You know, like here we have 
uh, the knight, the um, the king, the queen, the rook, all that. And um, it's interesting how these things come down through the Indian and Persian versions, you know, all through the European versions and, and wind up to what we have today. But nevertheless, you know, the representation of the characters fundamentally creates the shape of the experience of the play. Very medieval. Now, the other as aspect I um, ask you about is that how easy are your rules? How, how quick can your players learn the game and get going? Because, you know what, you want to make this as frictionless as possible? Just get it going. You know, you want to open this up, maybe 10 minutes reading the most, discuss it a little bit, get playing. Because this is, this is about playing. This isn't about learning instructions. This isn't, this isn't a uh, calculus class, right? And then the other thing that's really kind of interesting is that, I mean, they're, think, of the, think of the card game Uno. Super simple rules. And really easy to get playing. So, um, think of how you're adding chance into it. Are you pulling cards? Are you rolling dice or throwing stones? And uh, are you combining these things? I mean, consider once again going back to Monopoly. You've got all of these elements of chance in your gameplay and your mechanics. You've got rolling of dice. You've got these. Um, you know, you've got these chance uh, spots. Then, if you run on these other chance spots, you pick up a card, which then gives you another randomization of, of, of events. So, I mean, consider your level of complexity and your level of, you know. Um, so the thing is, is that giving a lot of chance can be really fun, but you just have to be really careful about the idea of not introducing so much complexity that you're... Uh, in the rules that you're hindering gameplay. So, uh, for assignments and dates, uh, pretty much the case study, idea, all uh, case study, idea, sketches, work, initial crits are due on Wednesday. And um, take a look at them over the weekend. And then I'll give you uh, another three or four days to submit, and then we go and we start working on the um, text-based game in Twine and Renfrew. So thanks so much.